Hi, everyone. My name is Bethany Larson, and I am an external evaluator with Larson Evaluation and Design, LLC, and I am presenting a brief introduction to a wonderful project that I completed with the Learning and Talent Development Office in uh, the Office of Human Resources at UW-Madison. This is our Communities of Practice Impact Evaluation Report. If you are interested in reading the full report, which is a mere 17 pages with lots of pictures and fun drawings. You can find it on the LTD homepage right there in the middle, LTD Communities of Practice Impact Evaluation Report. I encourage you to download it. It's lots of fun, good pictures, and it goes into more depth with our thematic analysis, with our methods, with a full appendix of all of the quotes that we collected from people whose voices deserve to be heard and archived in, uh, in writing. So I encourage you to flip back to that report and share it widely. Meanwhile, again, this is me, and I'll be taking you through a brief tour of the report so that you can dive in on your own later. So. Why did we commission this evaluation right now? Well, this is the 10th anniversary of the oldest community of practice from LTD, the Quilters Group. And here's a picture of us celebrating our 10th anniversary together by painting what quilters means to us. Uh, the gentleman down in the center row in the front is Harry Webney Behrman, and Harry has been convening quilters and other COPs for LTD uh, for the last 10 years and recruiting and inspiring other communities of practice on campus as well. So it's about time that we start figuring out what is the impact of these communities of practice as a talent development mechanism or strategy um, on a higher education campus. To our knowledge, this hasn't been done before, and we're excited to document the changes that we've seen. We just looked at these seven communities of practice, um, and they all have a different story, a different um, life cycle, different trajectory through their development. Some um, have matured to a steady state, others reinvent themselves at every meeting, um, some have died and then been resurrected as um, new iterations. So every community has a life of its own because it's a real community. So we used, um, we, ne we wanted to assess what are the impacts of these communities on the folks who participate in them and on the broader institution once those folks leave their COPs and go back to their institution, UW-Madison? This is important because UW-Madison, as a state-funded institution, is under budget pressure, like most organizations in today's economy. Um, this is just a picture from the latest data digest from UW-Madison. I'll draw your attention to the bottom left corner, which is the percent of budget supported by state taxes, um, which has gone down steadily over the years and recently took another large dip that has caught everyone's attention and really prompts us to ask, um, what are the best strategies for us to invest in as a university? Right. When an organization is under pressure, what do they do but invest their resources in the strategies with the highest leverage? So we want to see what is leverage or we might say the return on investment that we're getting for time invested in these communities of practice because we know the time is money. And for us, then with that money, we buy time and time buys us impact. And that's why we exist as a university is to impact the state and the world um, for the better good. It's the Wisconsin idea. So we wanted to know what is the return on investment, so to speak, for these communities of practice, but also because they're communities and not um, an investment in a capital building where we can calculate depreciation or something like that, we also wanted to ask secondarily, how do you calculate return on investment for a community of practice? So two main purposes. What is the ROI and how do you calculate it? So we had to develop uh, new quote unquote calculation tools, which for us look like developing a new impact glossary of vocabulary for categorizing, naming, and making sense of what was going on in these COPs. So we combined 
two frameworks that, to our knowledge, had not been combined before. Um, although, as you'll see, they're very powerful once they get together. The first is Etienne Wenger's glossary around communities of practice um, from his work that has been uh, impacting the world for the last 20, 30 years. Um, so we're looking here at domain, community, and practice, and we'll show that on the next slide. And then uh, Kirkpatrick's levels of impact, which has been very influential in the human resources training field in particular. So our main audience, the human resources department at University of Wisconsin and other HR departments elsewhere are familiar with Kirkpatrick. So we're marrying these two, W plus K, and the full definitions are in the report. So these are just excerpted from the report. I'll briefly tell you, um, remind you here that we're looking at the domain, the community, and the practice, and the levels of impact, reaction, learning, behavior, and results. So domain, community, and practice are three distinct but not separable indicators of the health of a community of practice. So just like a human's health could be indicated by a suite of vital signs like um, temperature, skin perfusion, respiration rate, pulse rate, those things together indicate the health of the person. No single vital sign is an accurate indicator. We need to look at those things together. So that's what we did with domain community and practice. And then um, Kirkpatrick's levels of impact are really looking at first the immediate reaction of folks who participate in a training um, event or in this case community meeting and then what are they learning from that how does that learning then change their behavior and how does that behavior then accrue to results for their unit their university and the larger systems in which they're embedded all right so we used several different forms of data to get at these impacts the first was an ad adapted web-based survey um, that really got at this domain community and practice. So this was adapted from an Asia Development Bank survey that had been used previously, and that survey was developed in order to help the ADB assess um, how to improve those communities of practice that they had been using in their organization. So our... Um, our evaluation was to look at the impact of these um, of these communities of practice. And so um, we adapted the survey to focus on UW-Madison, but some of those questions really weren't getting at impacts. They were really getting at improvement levers. And so we added um, to our suite of data that we were collecting um, a look back at all of the notes that Harry had taken as the convener. So for the most part, these notes went all the way back to the inception of each COP. And they were taken originally just to help Harry keep track of what had happened in the meetings and what was going to happen next and keeping sort of um, organizational logistical notes, a few notes about what had been discussed, what was learned, what people were learning, aha moments. But Again, those notes were not designed to capture impact. They were designed to keep a record of what had been happening. So we filled in with a third form of data collection, which is I sat down with Harry and did two semi-structured interviews where I really dug into those last two levels of Kirkpatrick's, um, Kirkpatrick's framework, looking at the behavior changes and the results that had accrued to organizations. And then we used the various data analysis methods that fit our data. So with this survey, we used quantitative bar charts to get a read on these, you know, set of vital signs for each COP. I used my qualitative data analysis software, Max QDA, to help me analyze the themes in the notes. And Harry and I um, sat down frequently and talked about um, what we were seeing and what was making sense and coming out of these themes. I also took a few opportunities to sit down with a couple of the groups who had fewer notes or fewer responses from their survey to fill in some of the gaps 
in data there. So um, I sat down with level five and did a focus group and uh, also talked a bit with quilters and UW Maniac also had a couple of focus groups. So here are the first of our results. I'll give you a, a brief report on kind of what these COPs are, what they do, um, and then we'll go further into what is their impact. So the thing that all of these have in common is that they meet pretty much once a month and they meet for about an hour and a half, usually at some casual location like a table at the union or maybe in a conference room somewhere. And um, everyone has been having some kind of email exchange leading up to the meeting to know what the agenda is for the meeting or what they're thinking about. And then whoever's available will come. Usually, you know, 80% of the people are the same and then you have 20% fluxing in and out, but it depends on the, on the group. And, um, that's about all they have in common. They're all looking at some form of human systems complexity in the workplace. But then as far as how they organize themselves, it's very different. Quilters um, has an emergent agenda at every meeting. So the folks show up and they build an agenda when they sit down together and then they go through the agenda. Um, level five is somewhat similar to that, although it there's less even of agenda building and more of a free flowing discussion for the meeting time. Uh, the PPLC establishes um, a set of a of a series of usually four um, workshops and in series to to work through that servant leadership does something similar, working through a, like kind of a book study together. Um, UW Maniac has a, a, their own design team. They do a lot of programming. So they're all doing something slightly different and they all focus on something slightly different and uh, therefore structure their communities and their practices in slightly different ways. So I encourage you to go back and read the report if you want to learn more about this. So I'm just going to briefly flash a few of these diagnostic graphs up on the screen to entice you to go back to the report and read more. Okay, so overall, the COPs are really healthy. They scored an average of 79% on a scale of 0 to 100 as far as how much people agreed with these, that they're seeing these indicators of COP health in their organization or in their COP. You'll notice that the overall performance in these boxes up top is showing that um, community and domain is really well um, is very strong, but there's less strong, although still um, remarkable um, as far as definition of practices. And then uh, the dark black bars show the highest scoring category or vital sign for each community of practice, and that differs amongst each community. So this would indicate that some COPs are better at some parts of being a COP than others are, just depending on how they spend their time and, and have evolved over time. So again, here are the diagnostic graphs, and in the report there's a little more qualitative description of each COP as well. Okay, here's the exciting part, the impact results. All right, so we're gonna go through um, the level, Kirkpatrick's levels of impact, starting with the reactions that folks have to participating in the COPs. Overall, uh, everything is extremely positive. So for example, this has been an excellent and helpful experience. I met a lot of very helpful and knowledgeable people. I would love to continue participating in this in the future. And likewise, working with these groups is incredibly powerful and helpful. So these positive reactions are things that trainers love to hear from their participants because that means that the participants would want to keep participating and using the things that they've learned in the training, or in this case, the participation in the community. Another one, they have been a much valued and appreciated lifeline for me. I am grateful for COP gatherings and networks. So those reactions then open the way for learning. So for instance, there's always an action-oriented component problem solving in level five. You get this bump that helps you get unstuck, crystallize a vision. There's a level of comfort and trust. 
Similarly, every topic discussed develops a deeper and more complete understanding in a group setting than in a solitary environment. So again, this is something we're seeing that's unique to communities of practice because of the community aspect. And the practice really does uh, generate a lot of learning that then changes behavior, which is really cool and doesn't get assessed very often in um, training programs. So here's an example. The discussions we have each month change the way I approach conflict and the way I approach my daily work. I am more likely to take time to address the underlying conflicts face-to-face -face rather than letting them simmer. Another one, I have included staff far more in the decision-making processes of our unit and become more engaged with my staff on a personal level. And these then generate amazing results through this ripple effect that we're going to explain a little bit um, further after uh, in, in the next section of the of the talk. So results that we're seeing, COPs give you free resources outside of your normal job duties, low or no cost support, right? So these are, um, we're seeing extremely high return on investment because there's a low investment with lots of results and impact coming out the other side. Also, when people have long-term trusting relationships and speak the same language, it's easier to make connections and dive straight into collaborations as opportunities emerge, that is, emerging outside of the COP. So they're building social capital that then transfers across other job duties, committees, sections of the university. And lastly, the nature of the group being an inclusive and ego-free group of diverse backgrounds and perspectives has caused me to be more aware of and look for those qualities in the teams I'm working on. So people are fundamentally shifting their the way that they're operating in their workplaces, regardless of uh, the unit that they're working in. So what's the key to these impacts? I mean, these are, these are really transformative, and that's really the word that we would use. Uh, and it all starts with experiences like this. You see the amazing evidence of all four levels in this one picture of UW Maniac. This is an event they ran called Kindergarten for Grownups. And uh, the reaction clearly is extremely positive, lots of laughter, fun, um, tons of learning about creativity, and uh, the folks who have reported about this event and others from UW Maniac in particular have mentioned how their behavior in their workplaces has become more innovative and creative, which of course then accrues to amazing um, innovations across their units and the university. And it's because of identity transformation in a landscape of practice. So this idea of a landscape of practice is that there are many types of communities of practice or other formal or not informal um, groupings of people in a workplace, in community, university partnerships, and beyond. So in this, the act of engaging in a community of practice helps us um, develop new ways of imagining possible futures in alignment with other people in their ways of thinking, in the practices that they're using, and in the visions that they also have for the future. So this, these three, um, these three fundamental processes of alignment, imagination, and engagement are the mechanisms of identity transformation. And then that person takes that new identity with them as they traverse this landscape of practice where they might also participate in a work team, in their regular job duties, or in a university committee. So our first question, our main question, what is the return on investment from these communities of practice? The re ROI is huge. And it's because of this identity transformation in a landscape of practice through alignment, engagement, and imagination. So there's a lot of cool social theory that could be unpacked in this. And I know that Etienne Wenger and other folks are working on it. And we look forward to being a case study example for the theories that are being developed, um, along with other um, questions about um, 
the role of the individual person in um, in social impacts and and other ways of expressing university engagement um, through social practice that starts within the university and then ripples outward. Um, in our case, from to, to the city of Madison and then the whole state of Wisconsin and eventually the world that we have documented um, our impacts all the way from a COP to a global scale. Okay, so I hope that this has gender generated some questions for you, some inspiration. I encourage you to again download the report, and if you have any further questions or thoughts or um, epiphanies, please feel free to contact me or Harry Webney Behrman. Thank you so much. Now get out there.